Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of arts, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be discussing art and writing, focusing on the very first season of Nick Pizzolatto's True Detective specifically the philosophy of Rust Cole, and even more importantly, the inspiration behind the philosophy, and that is with Thomas Ligotti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. To hash it out, of course, I am joined by one of our executive contributors. That's right. You know him. The best that the Louisiana Bayou has to offer, Mr. Theodore Bucky Ledoux, but we usually just call him Buck. Welcome, Buck. Thank you. I don't (laughs) need nothing too snooty. (laughs) <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that I think human consciousness Oh, he's in character, it's a, guys. It's a tragic misstep in evolution. <laughs> oh, he's it in character. too self-aware of nature created. An aspect <laughs> of nature separate from itself. Do you have this memorized, or are you reading? I always have this. I mean, everything. It's all, it's all one ghetto, man. <laughs> it's a giant gutter in outer space, just like my program, oh, man, the Texas Longhorns. Their football program right now. Uh, hey, is Buck in there? Can we can we bring Buck out for a little bit? I don't know, man. I, I gotta <laughs> I gotta put down my Lone Star Bear and see if he's over okay. Here. And you're in your camel on. camel cigarettes. My camel cigarettes. And my long hair. You must be off today mustache. because when you're when you're off, you start drinking at noon, right? See, a time's like a flat circle. Let's pull it back, Buck. Welcome to the show, man. As always, that Thank was you. great. Thank you. Tip Thank your waitresses. You. He'll be here all week. I so, will be here all week, all night. Um, and then uh, next week I'll be uh, in Seattle at oh, the okay. Laugh Factory. So, oh my! Oh, he's going on tour. I didn't know that. Okay, well, yep. oh, we're giving it's him a my plug Russ right Cole, now. My Russ Cole uh, <laughs> one man show. Russ Cole one man show. That is perfect. We've um, we are so excited to talk about this today because we have kind of God. This has been on our radar for a long time. And on honestly, anybody listening right now. Uh, listen for the Easter eggs in our, in our other shows. We often quote Rust Cole regularly. So, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we knew inevitably we were going to be doing a whole show on the philosophy that is Rust Cole, right? When this show came out, we were talking about it nonstop. And I think the memes and stuff that were all out there, we were sending them to each other. I mean, this was one of those pinnacle like moments in time where uh, pop culture um definitely like every when i love when everybody's like on the same page and watching the same show Mm -hmm. this is like one of those great times where we were all doing that 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 time and just kind of on the edge of our seats like every week trying to figure out what's going on i don't feel like we've had too many of those lately probably not since like the game of thrones series but man that time when you had this show and prior to that i think we had breaking bad that was oh, we're we were in a roll before that. We were oh yeah, and we were just on a roll. Well, and and that's why we wanted to talk about writing today. It is an absolute art form, as we all know, and nothing has quite matched the work of that first season, right? And and it was just powerful. It was so yeah. different for its time. Even though though I would I would argue that the story around the characters has been told before in a lot of different fashions. But sure. those characters and the philosophy and what we learned behind the scenes or around the scenes of the heart and soul of a story like that, what is which is just a murder mystery. You know, we we have a million of these, right? We have crime shows, movies. Uh, dedicated to every aspect. We we absolutely love this in pop culture, right? We cannot get enough of the murder mystery. It's the murder porn. Yes, but we usually I mean, I mean, don't if get characters about it, like this, right? No, you don't see characters like this in deep character studies, too. And by the way, I, I know I'm me. jumping ahead here. No, no, give it to me. Fantastic casting oh throughout my God. this whole show. Oh, I my mean, God. I want to see more I don't know shows. how many times I say this, but, you know, give me a little bit, but save save a lot for later. Save a lot yeah. for later. Yeah, but we'll, we'll definitely dive into that because, man, I would love to see more Maddie, Maddie Mick Conahay. <laughs> the McConaughey, right? <laughs> yeah, the McConaughey. <laughs> Can, can you imagine this? This dude was like in Sahara and fucking, you know, uh, how to I lose a guy. Uh, I was about to say how to lose a guy in 10 days. No, he was in. Um, 
He was just in so uh, many like rom-coms, Failure right? Failure to launch is one. Yeah, yeah. I he got was just in a million rom-coms, dude. and then he started doing Dallar, D- Dallas Buyers Club. He was in this. He was Don't in forget, uh, I was also Interstellar. In contact. Yeah, yeah. Jody we just uh, where we talked to twenty years ago. If you would have told me that we would have had a Matthew McConaughey McConaughey, I would have never believed you. I would have said, nah, nah. that guy gets an Oscar for acting. Nah. That's, that's no, yeah, yeah, and and now he's he's you know the, you know he's but he's here talking we are, about right? politics now. Yeah, and... he's he's a big deal. But let's pull it back. Let's do a novo. Let's do a novo pullback, and yep. uh, we need because we need to you know have a little background as all the people love. But uh, yes, this story specifically. Now we got to tell the people listening that haven't seen the show. Now, True Detective is an anthology series. So spoiler if alert: if you haven't gotten into it. That first season is an absolute masterpiece and don't feel obligated to watch it feeling like I know sometimes I don't like to get into a new show because I'm like, oh, my God, I don't have time to dedicate, you know, to dedicate my time to, you know, five or six seasons of a show to get in the story. It's just one season, eight episodes, 10 episodes. Eight episodes. Yeah. And you'll be able to knock it out in a week or two. And you'll be so happy you did. Do yourself a do yourself an artistic favor, as I like to put it, and get into it. You might uh wipe it out in a day. You never know. Oh, I uh oh oh put a pin in that. I've I have something to okay. tell you later. Okay. So so uh again, in the last decade, we have not really experienced this level of writing, something that has just lingered in our minds, something that we have analyzed and just digested and chewed on and have talked about for years and years and years. It really made us think. And so here we are. Time to talk about it. I do want to give, before I go into the background, I do want to give a quick honorable mention that in the last 10 years, this was, I would say, close to a tie for first place in terms of writing that was absolutely captivating. And that goes to Jillian Flynn. She's done work with Gone Girl, Sharp Objects, and a lot of other work that I think has just really stood the test of time and has done an amazing amount uh for the art that is writing so we will probably do a piece on her one of these days but today is uh nick pizziolato's true detective and Russell. i will i will throw in a second oh uh, please honorable me- mention uh the first season of sam sam Esmail's um mr robot okay all right very was fantastic good. uh if you don't know the background behind mr robot um it is a series uh, but it was originally uh, designed to be a film and never caught on to anybody. So he made it into a series. So mm. it is definitely has some tropes in his shot. I think it got a little long in the tooth, but um, towards the towards the end of it. But it was definitely you could tell designed to be a film. OK, very good. Excellent. It's like it's a pre gym, a gym of the week in, in a way. So uh, sort of. Yeah, kind of. I like it. I like sort it. Sort of pre gym so, for your gym. Yeah, pre gym gym of the week. So before, but you know, before we can really hash it out and discuss, we need a little background. So Nick Pizziolato, the writer of True Detective and the creator of the show, uh, he wears many hats. He's a short story writer, a novelist, screenwriter, producer, and even director. And as I already said, he is the sole creator of the show True Detective. And uh, against normal, usually. Uh, industry tactics and strategies for writing a show like this. He was the sole writer for the entire, I think, first season and second season. Um, and usually there, there's a team of writers, but he did everything by himself, including the director that we'll talk about here in a moment. They were a, uh, a dangerous duo. True Detective season one, that is. Again, our focus was inspired by a lot of things. The biggest one is, of course, Thomas Ligotti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, Eugene Thacker's And the Dust of This Planet, Ray Brassier's Nile Unbound, Jim Crawford's Confessions of an Antinatalist, David Benatar's Better Never to Have Been, as well as being inspired by horror authors, Laid Barron, John Langan, Simon Strantas, and Thomas Ligotti again. He, of course, unsurprisingly, has a B.A. in English and in philosophy. He's also written and co-written for films such as The Magnificent Seven, Galveston, which was also based on a novel that he wrote, The Deadwood Movie, and most recently, The Guilty, uh, which is – Buck doesn't know this, but so we're going to talk about it right now. That is why Nick Pizziolato got back into my orbit. 
That's why. So me and my wife saw The Guilty on Netflix. Um, yeah, it, it stars Jake Gyllenhaal. It's essentially, as my wife put it. Hey, the, hey, the, hold on a second. Jake, what? give back that, that scarf. <laughs> His Give Taylor is- back her, her scarf. Oh, God. Yeah, that's a deep God. cut. Oh, man. Sheesh. Or maybe it's not a deep cut. Huh. It's not. Yeah, because this the it's, whole it's, the whole Taylor Swift thing was a back uh, was a back or the new the piece is again. about Jake Gyllenhaal, right? Well, no, well, she's re-recording all of her. Yeah, but this particular uh, single, uh, her her newest single is about the breakup the st- with Jake Gyllenhaal, right? Yeah, but it's it's a re-recording. It's 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 a re-recording of an album of because song yeah, because of her original masters are owned by the. Um, the record company and she's the record company you know, that started her right so she okay. she she created a 10 minute song that you know ah of course that's, know, yeah, that's could, why that's yes she had to so yeah, um she because, wants her scarf back because this writer let me pull it back because this writer has such a recognizable name you know it's the same reason i don't use my real name i need something that people will actually remember uh pizzolato i'm not even sure if i'm pronouncing this right it could just be pizzolato but um, it is such a recognizable name that at the end of the guilty, when I started seeing the credits roll, I saw that name written by, uh, our, our gentleman here. And he, uh, and I was like, God, I know that name. And then it, it just came flushing back. True detective that first season, mm-hmm. it is time to finally talk about this thing and tell the people why damn things matter, of course. And, uh, so, so the first season premiered on January 12th, 2014, and it tells the story of Rust and Marty. Two homicide detectives on a quest to unravel the mystery of a series of very specific ritualistic murders and the conspiracy surrounding surrounding them. So very, uh, the story has been told, but usually we don't get a deep dive uh, character study and character development like we did with these characters and supporting characters. Uh, Rust and Rust Cole was played by Matthew McConaughey, as we've already joked about. Martin Marty Hart was played by Woody Harrelson. Uh, another name that should definitely be on all of your radars is the director. Carrie Joji Fukunaga was, um, I knew that he had a style right away. I was like, this is going to be one of my guys. Yep. He was, and it's no surprise. You probably don't know the name, but you know his work. He just did the new Bond, mo- the new Bond movie, No Time to Die. That was him. And uh guy, he's kind of one of the top new directors too. Oh yeah, right now, so. he's great. I absolutely yeah. love his his style, his choices, his technique. It's it's absolutely captivating. Art design was by Joshua Walsh, and the title sequence was a collab between director Patrick Clare in his Elastic Studios, Antibody Studios, and Breeder Studios. Quick note on this little little tangent is this was the first time we saw that double um that double exposure style of of art design where you saw like it an outline of something like a, a figure of a person and then it was clear like and then it was silhouetted with the with the am i saying the right thing double not double exposure but they're super superimposed super pictures. Imposed, there yeah. we go superimposed pictures that had uh something that they had something in the background that they really wanted to show but it was it, but it created a figure with the original foreground picture. Mm-hmm. I loved it so much that I, uh, when I was designing the cover for my third piece, Post Meridium, I told our illustrator to to create that with the fruit fly design that I made. So oh, yeah. Post Meridium, the cover for that, uh, kind of borrows a lot of these concepts that I, I fell in love with from True Detective. So, fun fact. That's a cool fun fact. And before I move you on need to, to put talk- that in the... <laughs> And the liner notes. And, like the liner. <laughs> <laughs> and before we talk about the uh, inspiration for the philosophy with Thomas Ligotti, I did want to that I want to take out that pin now that we put down uh, with um, <laughs> you're joking about that people can see this in one day. I that's that's what I did. I binged. This is the only you show. Binged it. This is the only show I've ever done, or uh, this is the only thing I've ever done in one day. A full season of a story. And one day it was because, okay, there's a a quick little story around it It is because I was out the night before partying a little late. And sometimes I have a tendency to party a little hard. No, I've been getting hard. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, as I've been getting older, it's been a little harder to bounce back uh, on the next day or sometimes 48 to 72 hours. And so I was pretty much bedridden the day after. And it happened to be yeah. the weekend that either premiered the whole show. I don't know if they put it all out at once or it was at the end of the season, but I could watch back to back eight hours straight of True Detective season one. I wonder, <laughs> like, I would really like to just like set you down with like a psychologist after that and really start to like, <laughs> there's a show that's this deep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, give a check on you. No, I know that feeling. Uh, the last time I hung out with you, which we will not name the event, but um, mm-hmm. I was I was pretty much out for about solid three weeks. Oh, what three weeks? Not three days. <laughs> no, three... I, I I did not feel right Jesus for about Christ. a week and a half. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Okay, we we, that, we no... threw it down that night though. <laughs> yeah, we did throw it down. On that note, let's pull it back and let's talk about Thomas Ligotti. So Thomas Ligotti is an American horror writer. He primarily works within the genre of weird fiction, philosophical horror, or supernatural horror. His work and worldview is often considered pessimistic antinatalist or nihilistic does that sound familiar being mm-hmm. particularly fleshed out in the nonfiction 2010 book of Must philosophy the conspiracy against the human race so this was which is which is rare to see a book of philosophy that was put out in this century and just in the last decade and t book doesn't know this but i'm gonna i'm gonna show him right now i read this bitch See that? He's got it. Okay, folks. Right now, let me describe it to you. Um, He has it in his hands. He's got a a, a mischievous grin on his face as he's holding up the novel. This is good. Oh wow! I the, I read the, it's uh, over it's over two hundred pages of the dense, cover is frightening. Yes, yes, over uh, it's, it's over two hundred pages of incredibly dense philosophy, and I I knocked it out in about a week for this show. So I have a lot to say. And uh, spoiler spoiler alert: uh, the conspiracy is our consciousness. It's uh, so the argument in the book is that our consciousness brings about a level of mental suffering that no other species knows knows of or, or can understand. You know, that's what separates us from the animals kind of thing is our minds and specifically our consciousness. So the only way to truly escape this predicament, Buck, is through humanity's end to essentially cease existing specifically by halting procreation. So this is not like we all need to drink the Kool-Aid, not no, no mass suicides here. It's, it's no refraining sound from ma- massacre. Here. Yeah. It's refraining from, uh, reproducing. That is the, well, that is the philosophy. Does that sound, does that sound familiar? Well, what it this sound sounds like, like Cole? yeah, it sounds like the feel good, uh, philosophy book of the year for one thing so you need to take it easy man no more no more popping out kids right yeah the, on a the, baker's the dozen. eight that i have right now um, <laughs> i thought it was a baker's dozen <laughs> that's there. 13 13 <laughs> that's if you didn't know what a baker's dozen is it's not 12 it's 13 it's not 12 it's 13 because you have to have one more i i definitely see now that you've de- described this to me that makes a lot of sense now just from you know the character itself and and the influence that that has is yeah, I mean, and you, you're starting, you see a lot of this with some people too. And, and the philosophy of, of it, you know, human consciousness is one thing that's pretty interesting. Um, I, I am a, a product <laughs> of a psychologist. Psychologist, so yeah. They like you, to talk you grew to, up with this hardcore. This. Ooh, I, I, I didn't uh, think about that going into designing and doing the uh, outline for this show, but yeah. you have a lot to say on the subject, don't you? Yeah, because it was, you know, we talk about it constantly. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding. Every time I, I sit down with, with my lovely parents, I love them to death, uh, we, have, we have very deep conversations about, uh, you know, I did not go into the family business, um, obviously, but uh, they uh, definitely like to talk about consciousness. They, they truly believe that it's the next like human evolutionary part um, that we don't understand. And it is true. It's very interesting. We don't really understand consciousness. We don't really understand, but it really has this impact on people and uh, how we perceive things in life. For me, as a, as a trained scientist, what I'm mostly interested in is how it, it, it alters our perception of time and space. Um, oh my gosh, yes. Oh, we love that shit. Oh, which yeah. I as I tried not to hit my microphone again. Oh no, if you have to. I feel like it's a I, I hit it. Now. I hit it every it, it, every what? show we have to have a a uh, a mic stand um you know elbow hit. 
Yeah. So, folks at home, if you if you've been listening closely, it's if it's you're new two to the show, so <laughs> two so far. Yeah, but it, th- this whole perception of consciousness and how it's kind of a drain on on us as a whole. I mean, really gets back to you know a lot of philosophy that I've kind of read and also looking at just the human condition as a whole oh yeah it's either something that you can take as like this this truly this wonderful tool that we have to do beautiful things but it also and probably arguably more terrible things um so (laughs) it's kind of a bummer (laughs) well that is uh that's part of the argument of the conspiracy is that um there's a lot of things that the mind can help beget but the unfortunate reality is that We will always end with suffering because the other half of the conspiracy is the fact that we all die, that the the inevitability of our existence is death and that we even though we try to do all these things to prevent it or prolong our lives or things like that, the the reality is that. You know, when we really get right down to it, our lives are meaningless because of the concept of death. Yeah. And we're ultimately just a bunch of rotting bags of meat. Now, this is not me talking. This is Thomas Ligotti talking. (laughs) (laughs) When Novo and I get around, he he likes to just sit there. I get real philosophical. I get real dark. You know, man. And so, uh, man, I would, yeah, I would, I would love for God. Well, we would love to do a show. We know Thomas Ligotti is a huge fan of the show, just like yeah. Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. We'd love to get these three together on yep. the show and really hash it out. Uh, but today, it's just going to be me and t Bock, which I think is a good seg- segue to go into straight into our discussion section. But before we do that, we need a little word from our sponsor, right? Ooh, yeah. That this episode is brought to you by the novel The Entropy Sessions, a tale of loss, love, and madness in our in our past, present, and future relationships with technology. Find it on Amazon and as an audiobook through Audible. Your support helps us continue our journey. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> now let's get back to the show. Uh, so um, let's talk about uh, what was your. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the floor again, Buck. Uh, what was your first impression of seeing? specifically number the emphasis on the show is the writing and the philosophy of Russ Cole. Uh, how did, how did give me a little more, how did you react to um, that curveball of a character come your way? I, the first, uh, the first <laughs> episode I remember watching and I've been like, man, I rewatched it for this show too, just so I, could I, I, I wanted fresh to, in my mind. I wanted to, uh, I did not have time this week. Uh, I was, I was traveling, but he's our inter- international man of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I, it wasn't international. It was, it was domestic this time. Um, no, I, I think, you know, the first time I watched it and I listened, I, it was, you watch certain shows Sure. And sometimes, and I, I'm guilty of this, folks, and I think some of you are as well. You can kind of watch a show and have it almost in the background and kind of start looking like your phone, like oh, looking God, yes. at text, maybe playing a little bit of solitaire. Or, oh, we all do you know, that. Oh, some dude, don't, even, don't even play. Don't um, even play. We all do that. You know, because, you know, I'm, what I'm describing is like a, a, a 90-year-old person on a computer. <laughs> um, no, but it was one of those shows where like – I. You you automatically knew just from the dialogue it locked me in like I I just I could oh, not yeah. stop watching it. That's why I watched um, the whole show in one day. Yeah, it it just kind of captured and the f- actually my favorite parts of those that whole series was those drives where he would be talking about the human condition and or or the interviews philosophy. like or later, the interviews yeah yeah later, later like seventeen. 17- 17 years after them trying to figure out this murder mystery investigation, you know, he's, he like he's got his, dealer. oh yeah, he looks yeah. great. He's got his facial. Oh man, you just got to see him. <laughs> and, um, just, just Google an image of rust Cole, and you'll see yeah. exactly what old rust Cole, <laughs> old rust Cole. You'll see the makeup they put him in. It was just epic. He and, looks like he's driving a trans am and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's got like, he's a got his old thing of his old, but ice on the back. Gear. Yep. <laughs> Maybe some red dog. Yeah, but or Lost it was Lake just, or whatever that old yeah. like, cheap beer is. Ooh, we can start going through all of them. He he might have some some mad dog or some you know yeah <laughs> some Colt forty five. Some Colt forty five. He and I bet you he, he's got something for the ladies. He's got a bottle of Boone's Farm Snow Creek. Oh Apple. man, he's a classy guy. He's a classy anyway, guy. Anyway, anyway, he's got fortified wine. Um, Send the bed. Uh, let's you, pull okay, back. can I go on a uh, no. T-Buck well, Tangent well, Corner? No, this one, this one's too obscure. Well, 
No, I was well, just that's what the talk show's about... all about. Now, now you can't do that. Now we no, gotta no, no. It's too obscure. I'll tell you later, but because this one will even leave you because it's about Thunderbird, a uh, uh, fortified wine and a commercial a guy did like seventy years ago. Anyway, but I I I, I get entertained by watching let's, it on YouTube. Let's pull it back to Rust. That's, so, yeah. that's what I said. It's he, too far he's, off. He's um. They're what they have to do is they have to. Uh, they said that. Uh, I think Hurricane Rita destroyed a bunch of files. So that's part of the way you're getting the exposition and you're seeing these these monologues by Russ yeah, Cole. I, I just want to, I am a sucker for Southern Gothic, um, anything. And that was really what I got into this originally was the setting. And I love Southern Gothic kind of tropes and, and themes and things like that. Because uh, ladies and gentlemen, the South scares the hell out of me. It is like a different country in my mind especially louisiana the swamps voodoo oh yeah the french thing every, the bayou. everything you that's why the when, bayou, when, in the yeah. intro i was like this is the best that the louisiana bayou has to offer it's bucky exactly Ledoux. exactly so do you remember that character there was a character named reggie Ledoux. that's where i got it from and <laughs> me and my wife would make fun of it like oh god reggie Ledoux's coming back reggie into Ledoux. the picture so we had bucky Ledoux. that's why bucky so that's, Ledoux. That's, that was my deep cut um, but okay, let's you, you let's know. let's dive into it. I feel like we're gonna sidetrack forever. So I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna actually read the writing, and then we're gonna talk about it. So this is, uh, so, and we're gonna do a few of his most famous lines. Okay, so Rust. I think human consciousness is a tragic misstep in evolution. We became too self-aware. Nature created an aspect of nature separate from itself. We are creatures that should not exist by natural law. We are things that labor under the illusion of having a self, the secretion of sensory experience and feelings programmed with total assurance that we are each somebody when in fact we are nobody. I think the honorable thing for our species to do is to deny our programming, stop reproducing, walk hand in hand into extinction. One last midnight, brothers and sisters opting out of a raw deal, Marty. So what's the point of getting out of bed in the morning? Rust. I tell myself I bear witness. But the real answer is that it's obviously my programming and I lack the constitution for suicide. Like that is fucking, oh, we just don't see characters like you, this. You just, no. And it, it, it's so deep. But I remember that that was actually the first time we saw Rust. Like yeah. the, the the philosophy that is Rust and the entire show. This is the, that was the very first monologue he did. And I was like, oh, fuck. I know what and, I'm in for. And one thing that is great about and it's this also, it's cast- also sorry to interrupt, but there's no, something about performance too. I feel like yeah. if, it, if, it, if this was done by, and then just to piggyback on what Buck said earlier about casting, this is perfect casting because if it wasn't done right, the performance, because just reading it, you know, it flat like that, you could see yeah. that it would, it would not land properly without the right performance. And when I was rewatching the show yesterday, I was like, Oh fuck! Like this, this like the, he felt real to me, right? Oh yeah, and that's, and, that's, and the the philosophy felt real. That's kind of where I was going with that too, is the casting because when you watch some of these monologues that Russ gives, and Marty played by Woody Harrelson, the thing is like you you get so drawn into like what Russ is saying, and like you're like, oh my god, that's so messed up, and the brilliant casting and performance by Woody Harrelson. Sometimes he just kind of looks the side like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Well, yeah, about? he's he's the antithesis, yeah. right? Yeah. So Woody Harrelson's character, Marty, is the antithesis of Russ. Exactly. Rust. So you have that you have that conflict between the characters and it becomes exciting. That's how you create drama, right? You want conflict. And this is where like we can talk about some of the controversies of the show. This is where people were like, well, this is kind of cliche we see Mm -hmm. odd couple characters all the time but we usually in a murder mystery i cannot stress this enough the focus is usually on the murder and the mystery not on the and 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 there is a focus on that but not on the on the characters surrounding it and that's why it became so fascinating and not only the characters not only are we getting a glimpse at the characters surrounding it but the fact that this guy has this very specific philosophy and character type that we usually don't see before we don't usually don't see in shows like this i was trying to think of other shows to compare that to like <laughs> like ice tea and you know law and order or oh you yeah. know or the i think the gold standard for our childhood was seven you know where the um you know those brad pitt and um, which is a great 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 kid morgan freeman <laughs> yeah it's a great it's a great movie but what was the emphasis on it was on the murder mystery right and yeah. the sins 
the seven sins and ha- and the murders associated with it because well, I can't even remember interaction with her at all. I don't even know their names. No, you know. Yeah, but 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 you know the you're right with the dichotomy of those two characters. You have this well seasoned, very intelligent, uh, diligent detective, kind of with this young kind of not dumb or per se, <laughs> but maybe not as as intellectual. I love the scene where he goes into the library in the middle of the night. Um, and just that's what he does is he sits there and does research. So uh, and the other controversies surrounding it is, of course, the the philosophy is Thomas Ligotti. He it was saying that this was a plagiarism. You know, it wasn't just uh, that, he was inspired that was the by weird part about all this. Yeah. yeah. And I I'm sorry, but I will actually defend defend the side that this was not plagiarism. Because when I think of true plagiarism, it is almost a copy of the original, right? We see this more in music. Those are easier examples or some that shouldn't actually be prosecuted. But and again, I'm talking about music, but it is for some reason. But in writing, it's there's one thing to be inspired. He clearly read the work and was inspired by the work, and he even admitted to that. But just putting a few monologues and pieces of dialogue to put the philosophy of Thomas Ligotti into the character does not mean he is literally stealing the lines from the book to put into the into the show right if yeah. or if there was like you know if there if Thomas Ligotti wrote a story about you know <laughs> dust coal and that's what I was going to say if the if the character was name was like Thomas Pigotti in the show and he had like all these you know, yeah, that would be more true plagiarism. And I and I don't think it's a coincidence that I couldn't find, you know, when I was doing homework for the show research, I couldn't find anywhere that this was actually like that he actually sued Nick, Nick P. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think it went anywhere. In fact, if anything, it did him. I'm going to hold up the book again to Buck. If anything, it did him a favor because I read that he had more sales of his book uh, after this, like, essential, I think, almost... I wouldn't say manipulated controversy, but I feel like he he got a little butt hurt about, you know, putting a lot of these philosophical ideals into the character versus then. Oh, did you hit the stand? Yep. <laughs> That's we're gonna, a, do, we're gonna get you a medal or something. Well, we need to like if we ever if we ever put out video of this, we just need to have like a like we a probably tally. never will. I, uh, like, uh, like in the corner. Oh, in like the a corner timer? just have like, like or a, a little, little like, ding, a, like yeah, a ding. little like uh, like a little counter, counter, like a yeah. score, <laughs> scoreboard. Um, uh, let's let's pull it back. Well, okay. well one thing, um, kind of going. No, we, I was just going to say no. No publicity is bad publicity. So, oh, amen. I mean, like with oh, a yeah. lot of these things too. I know. So you agree like with he, me? You don't think this yeah. was plagiarism? Yeah, I think if you go back and, and there's a lot of examples of this where people get pissed off or think that people are copying one that Alan Moore. I can always think of him getting really upset about pieces of work being kind of manipulated or tra- kind of transform when they're transformed into a film. Mm-hmm. from his uh graphic novels and then you always read about how those graphic novel sales had just like shot through the roof because people go back and see this kind of stuff it's the same thing yeah it's it's hey yeah you might be upset at first but once once that once uh, those sales once those once, start rolling in i think once you get the nick okay. p bump you'll you'll be like ah it's okay because ah, you're fine. not going to ever find that probably again yeah exactly so, so let's uh, let's pull it back and let's do another um, let's do another monologue or quote by Rust. So this is Rust. Just observation and deduction. I see a propensity for obesity, poverty, a yin for fairy tales. Folks putting what few bucks they do have into a little wicker basket being passed around. I think it's safe to say nobody here is going to be splitting the atom, Marty. So what he's doing in this um, piece of dialogue, he is harshly criticizing religion and so they're they're at a Mm -hmm. i think a a small congregation very small kind of backwoods church service and rust is just criticizing and as someone as um i don't i don't think buck's gonna be shy to admit this both me and buck will just say we're very non-religious i could really relate to this you know where we are seeing these this character criticize these people that are obsessed with uh i think him saying a yin for fairy fairy tales is really telling yeah and i I think it's well yeah and it's kind of how i view it i I think it's even beyond religion 
um, you see this of why people get into even conspiracy theories. Oh God! Um, yeah. Like what? And, and sorry, I'm I'm just going to bring this up, but like QAnon, it's a big thing right now. Um, and I, I have a feeling, you know, part of the reason people are so drawn to that is because they have this yearn to really want to be a part of something bigger. Like they exactly. really feel like they and and when you when you get into that mode and and like I've gotten caught up in you know certain not conspiracies but like certain movements and well like, they could be fascinating because they they can be really people interesting love a good mystery right they love a good mystery but they also love the fact that they might be part of something big and i think yeah. that's always like with religion is you know a lot of people say you know well it's all part of a plan or if it's the you know the the meaning or the, you know this there's some sort of existence or teleological kind of um fate that you have i think a lot of people like to lean on that because when it all goes back it goes back to our um our uh, you know general emotions and feelings it, it brings you a feeling of comfort it reduces your fear in your body and this is probably a, a perfect segue to say the rebuttal so this is marty marty's reaction to rust you see that your fucking attitude not everybody wants to sit alone in an empty room beating off to murder manuals some folks enjoy community a common good rust yeah, well, if the common good's got to make up fucking fairy tales, then it's not good for anybody. So yeah. he's it's a tit for tat, right? We're seeing that yeah. antithesis again. And and Buck's as Buck was saying, um, Marty's trying to trying is trying to defend the fact that people want to be a part of something, right? And yeah. that's why we see. It, I think that's a human condition. And now we could kind of talk about the yeah existentialism in kind of group think right yeah and i and i want to be very clear i i am not saying that <laughs> i think religion is terrible and that you shouldn't be a part of it because the only reason you want oh no yeah let's let's be very clear where you know you do you we've always had <laughs> yeah we always have a stance of you guys do you we have we're not bashing anybody we're just uh bringing up questions to to ponder about I've had I can, countless conversations about this, and people automatically think because I'm not religious, I think all religion's stupid, and that you're stupid for being. I do not. I say do what you want to do, what makes you feel good. Because at the end of the day, if it's making you feel like you're going to be a better person and you're not hurting anybody, I'm all for then it. Do it. Yeah, I I say it this way. I say the perfect road in life is your road. Yep. You just have to make sure you're on it. And if that means that you're a devout Christian that goes to church every Sunday and that makes you happy and yada, I'm that's fine. If if yeah. that is your worldview, your perspective, your existence, yeah, I, then then keep living the best version of you. So yeah, the perfect road is always your road. Yeah, and not every and that's the other thing I try to tell a lot of people with this too, is like you 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 can tell I've 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 well, it's hard to talk about exhaustion. because they don't like being criticized, and I think criticism is still important. You have to still yeah. be able to criticize bad ideas, and religion has a lot of bad ideas. Yeah, and it doesn't matter which one it is. We're talking about all of them, and, and there's bad ideas everywhere. That's one thing I try to tell people is, you know, you, you can you can be a devout, and, and I'm all for that, but it doesn't mean I'm going to have everybody's going to agree with you or I'm going to agree with you on it, and then you have to be okay with that. Yeah, um, I, I think the other thing what I was going to what I was trying to say is that I think a lot of people when they get to this point and when you're in this discussion, they don't like the fact that you don't believe in what they do, they believe in. Sure. And they can't and that's really hard for them to comprehend because they've been kind of conditioned that if you don't believe in this way, then you're on the wrong path. And and that was a big right. thing. This is why I uh, That's the group think. This is why I got down. kicked. <laughs> this is why Sunday school teachers uh would always go to my parents because I started saying a lot of this shit when i was younger and <laughs> oh i just bit my tongue i for most of my childhood oh i was told I was, to just i'm not gonna go into the exact go. religion I, yeah. I grew up into but i uh, grew up into a pretty strict religious house yeah. and i kind of bit my tongue at i just i guess i i i guess i'll say it this way not i'm not necessarily um condoning what rust is saying he's he's giving yeah. extremely like like it's, harsh biting it's a criticism. Very, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying I can. I, look I can just, I'm just saying for all of the all of the people that are non-denominational or say that they're non-religious, you can feel like you've had those thoughts. You, that's how it's easier to connect to the character of Rust, even though he's he's yeah. still a caricature. He's very much someone that's at the end of the spectrum. 
you can you can definitely feel that way about things. I'm not necessarily saying it's right. I'm just saying that <laughs> he poses a lot of good questions a lot of the times. Yeah. So let's uh, let's pull it back and go into another piece of dialogue. Um, so this is Rust again. Transference of fear and self-loathing to an authoritarian vessel. It's catharsis. He absorbs their dread with his narrative. Because of this, he's effective in proportion to the amount of certainty he can project. Certain linguistic anthropologists think that religion is a language virus that rewrites pathways in the brain, doles critical thinking. So I don't think we need to beat a dead horse here. Um, he has a certain opinion about <laughs> religion. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I don't. I don't necessarily think it's it's that bad. Just as as Buck is saying, but um, it's 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 fascinating to see someone because we don't. I don't. I guess we can we can pull we can pull back a little further on uh, the scope here is that we don't see this kind of criticism of religion in characters much. And so for him, someone like him to do that, especially this pessimistic anti-natalist character that yeah. also is, has biting criticism of religion, you're, it just really stuck out to me. And, I, and that's, a, that's why it's always kind of it, um, stayed with me too. Here's another rust. If, o- if the only thing keeping a person decent is the expectation of divine reward, then brother, that person is a piece of shit. And I'd like to get as many of them out in the open as possible. So he's trying to defend why he's so critical of these of these people. Um, here's Rust again. The ontological fallacy of expecting a light at the end of the tunnel, well, that's what the preacher sells. Same as a shrink. See, the preacher, he encourages your capacity for illusion. Uh, and so it's, we're still yeah. seeing, you know, we're still seeing this this biting criticism. It's just, and then I just, just to bring up, pull it back to the writing. Oh my God, this is smart writing. This is just, oh, it's, I, yeah. I mean, just, I mean, just in, not, not in terms of narrative, actually, I'm actually talking about prose now, just in mm-hmm. how it sounds. It's very poetic. And f- to see actually um, Matthew McConaughey deliver these lines and perform this character and really become the character. I don't think he did full method for this, but I feel like, he could have, I could have, I could have seen him really falling into this character almost like, you know, people do when they play the Joker or something like it, it yeah. becomes, it becomes consuming. Here's rust again in eternity where there is no time, nothing can grow. Nothing can become nothing changes. So death created time to grow the things that it would kill. You are reborn but into the same life that you've always been born into. I mean, how many times have we had this conversation, detectives? Well, who knows? When you can't remember your lives, you can't change your lives. And that is the terrible and the secret fate of all life. You're trapped by that nightmare you keep waking up into. So that is my... This shit is deep. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead. Besides the next one, which I know... Yeah, this is the next one is like the, next the icing one, on the cake that we we usually will throw into a... But please tell me your thoughts on this. Uh, one no, my, on. my favorite quote from all of this was that so death is... So death created time to grow things that it would kill. I That one always stuck with me too. Um, that like when you watch the show or when you're yeah. just rereading the, the no, when I watched the show, that was out. another line okay. that really stuck with me. Besides, I think the, the next one is what everybody remembers, but that whole sequence right there, that was another thing where I just like dropped everything and like even time for me just became kind of like a you were so uber focused on his his dialogue <laughs> and he's he's going back to um the conspiracy, right? The conspiracy yeah. that is consciousness. So, where we're, we've gone. Uh, the two sides of the coin here is his pessimism. There's one, yeah. On one side, he's this pessimistic, anti-natalist, nihilist, and on the other side, he's he's very very critical of religion. So we're going back to that first side, the former, and we're seeing his philosophy on time itself, right? Yeah. And one thing I, I do want to point out real quickly, he is this way for some very specific reasons. Watch the show. It kind of gives a background of why he is the way this is, because he has some pretty tragic things happen to him. Well, we could we could talk about that. Okay, so spoilers. You know, again, if you're if you're listening to us, we're just going to assume and and expect that you've seen the show already. If you haven't, stop stop the recording. Stop stop. Just stop it. Go see it. it. 
go watch it and then come back. Uh, so he, he lost his daughter. He lost yeah. his daughter and it crushed him. His daughter passed away earlier in his life before we actually met the character in the show and it changed him, you know, yeah. it kind of, it really destroyed his, his soul in a way, the character that is Rust Cole and his, his conceptualization of self. And that's yeah. why he realized that, uh, going back into Thomas Ligotti's philosophy that life is essentially meaningless. Like everything we do is meaningless, that nihilism because of concepts and things in our existence as death, that truly nothing that you do really matters because in the end we all die. Uh, and but there he, is some o- optimism. Well, rust is just it. the rust is the, is the epitome of he embodies that entire philosophy you know, yeah. Rust is the philosophy in a way. Yeah, I would say until the very final scene, you see him kind of turn from a pessimist to an optimist. Well, and I think it's because he was like reborn because he, he was, was reborn essentially up, yeah. dead for a while. And that mm-hmm. that's where like the show does get. I will, you know, the show is not without flaws. Uh, and we'll talk about that before we, we end the show today. Uh, and that's part of the, I think, part of where the show got a little silly for me is that very last episode where uh like the like the, th- the yeah, universe what, vortex or whatever it was yeah what he was kind of talking about that and existentialism i was like ah okay like and 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 anybody in in real life i would have di- actually died where this this character like either beaten to a pulp or shot or you know he was he was on the verge of death did die anybody in real life would stay dead but he kind of comes back from the dead and this is where it felt like true fiction to me it's still a great show. It's still, you know, A plus, you know, kind of show compared to a lot of other things. But it's just not it's not without its flaws, of course. And um, and we've already talked we've already kind of touched on some of the other uh, controversies and stuff like that. But before we do, let's let's go ahead uh, and say the probably the most famous line in the show. And then, Buck, I want to hear what you think the saying the the line means. So this is Rust. Someone once told me that time is a flat circle. What does that mean to you, Buck? Time to me, me I mean, it almost kind of represents what I think of time as time is something that it's not linear, but it's, as he said, it's flat. Time always reoccurs, meaning like you always hear that uh, history repeats itself. Yes, that's what it, that's how I feel. Like we are, we are doomed. There we go. We are doomed to repeat our mistakes. That we can't seem to get out of this cycle of our of our flawed existence. It, it, it reminds me of a scene of that scene in um, No Country for Old Men, where Tommy Lee Jones goes and visits. I believe it's un- his uncle who got shot and is in a wheelchair, and <clears throat> he was also a police officer. And he he has this conversation with his uncle. It's, he's saying basically, times have changed so much. I don't recognize things how they were. And it seems like the world is just becoming a worse place. And what his uncle is telling him is that that has, that is exactly what people have thought throughout time. When, when things change, they always think the world is just getting worse and worse. It's not, it's only getting better and better. If you actually look at like metrics and statistics of homicide, homicide rates and suicide rates. It's not, it's it's everything is getting better. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's you as a person has changed. So, I mean, I see that too. I mean, we can we can go through so many examples throughout human history. <laughs> of just we don't things. have time, but we, uh, we don't have time. But that that look really up, is look it like up for yourselves, people. Unfortunately, history repeats itself and time repeats itself, and so it's not linear, but it's circular. It comes back exactly. Uh, well put. Um, I couldn't, yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. I agree. It that uh, mic drop. How I'll I see feel. you guys next yep. week. Bye. <laughs> He's not even saying for the gym. Oh, you I'm I'm gym. leaving. <laughs> um, before we uh, wrap this guy up and bring it on home, I do. Yeah, we've already kind of talked about the con- controversies of the philosophy, and uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, the allegations of plagiarism, and there are there are elements of cliches throughout the plot narrative and even the writing, and um, I think. In hindsight, the portrayal of women is not often seen in a very good light. Uh, and uh, But I think a lot of 
things have changed for development of these kind of characters. And I think with them, I will even argue a little bit for this specific story. I know that um, the portrayal of women gets a bad rap, but I think if you actually put it into the context, again, just like we were talking about the fact that Rust is a certain way because of what happened to his past. And a lot of these supporting characters, even though that it is you know, surrounding a murder mystery, there's a lot of, there's a lot of familiar drama. There's, there's extramarital affairs. Mm -hmm. There is, yes, the, the losing of, of children in, in the case of Rust and sex work and things like that. And once you actually dig into the world that he created, I think there's a reason why a lot of these things are set up the way they are and things are portrayed the way they are as well. So before we go into the gyms, uh, let's give the floor back to Buck. Buck, bring it on home. Why do the people tell the people why they need to see specifically the first season of True Detective? Don't worry about those other seasons. But that first that first season is a masterpiece. Why? It's a masterpiece in, in television writing, I think. Um, well, not just in television writing, just in screen. In all around. Overall. But yeah, the emphasis is on writing. So yeah, yeah, focus on the writing. I like. Yeah, that. it's definitely... Um, and I, I think we're kind of out of the golden age of television a little bit. Um, I, I, I see this as one of the I would disagree with you there. Um, I mean, come on, Squid Game? We're, we're in the international golden age of television no, now. Well, maybe international, but I would say... Um, I think we're still I, in I the think... golden age. We're just seeing different cultures bring different stories to us. So we're seeing an international appeal. So we're seeing writing on a... On a and just to pull a background circle, we're seeing writing on a brand new scale. Yeah, I'm still disagree with you. I, I, I think I think um it's become watered down. Okay. Um and yeah, we we you don't can go make off an argument. too off course. Let's I'm not, but yeah. what I what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to say is that this was definitely an apex uh peak point of yeah, um, I agree. Of of writing and 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 also just character development. And yeah, there you know some people didn't like the ending of it, but I think the journey there was much more worth it than, than maybe that ending and what people thought it was supposed to be. Absolutely. Um, so, so I, I really want people to watch this just to kind of keep that in mind that um, this is, this is, they should take it, the, the story as a whole and look mm -hmm. at it and don't focus on one thing because it, and it, it's, it's not an easy watch. Um, but it definitely no, I think is. It is Ewa. If you like, if you like, uh, crime shows and you know, there's some, there's some subject matter that's pretty hard. I mean, some people that it's, it, a trigger Maybe warning for some people. Yeah. <laughs> I know because some people, this kind of art, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just saying some people have had bad experiences in life and that might be hard yeah. for them to watch it. So I, but I would say overall it's, it's definitely one of the bright spots in, um, in the last that kind of era sure. in television. Yeah. Again, couldn't have said it better myself. Well put, Mr. Buck. Guys, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you. But before we go, you know we got a little more for you. A little icing on the cake. A little cherry for that Sunday with what we call the Gem of the Week. If you don't know what the Gem of the Week is, it's essentially something we like to talk about here at the end of our show. That doesn't always fit into the scheme of the episode, but we got to talk about it nonetheless because it may be on our radar in our orbit in the last day or so, week, maybe even month, but we want to give it to you so you guys can keep digging deeper um mine is um another album that i've kind of fallen in love with it's really an ep if i'm going to get really technical and that is the collaboration from bruno mars and anderson.pack known as silk sonic an evening with silk sonic is just so much fun and um i should say this it's more honestly it's more for Anderson.pack than Bruno Mars. I have followed Anderson.pack's career since Malibu, and there could be someone could be doing a quick cut episode on Silk Sonic, uh, maybe in the near future. It may come out before this, it may come out after. I don't know. I don't know. You'll just have to wait and see. Just Buck, have what to you wait around, see what's going on. <laughs> what have you been into lately, man? What have I been into lately? Well, I'm just going to give you just a little taste. Um, not really going to get into it because um, you have to watch it. Ooh, it's okay. a show called Midnight Mass. I've already seen it, but that's okay. You've already seen it? Yep. Of course I have. Yeah, have, have has this been one of your gems? It's not been a gem. Um, okay. I I really liked it. Again, you know, we use Radiohead as as a comparison for a lot of the stuff we talk about. I think um as compared to most shows, it uh is incredibly 
it, it can't hold a candle to something like Midnight Mass or his other stuff, you know, Haunting of Hill House, Haunting of Bly Ma- Manor. He did those shows too. Um, I think he did the uh, Doctor Oculus. Sleep. Yeah, he, he's done a lot of great stuff. Um, but this is and, the one that he wrote himself. And yes, the writing created. is excellent, excellent, excellent. I Mike would. Flanagan, I, who we're talking I, yes, about. I'm a little bit on the There's, side that thinks yeah. the there is maybe one or two too many monologues, uh, mm-hmm. but the monologues are overall the writing is superb. So it's on Netflix. Check it out. <laughs> let's know. Let's know what you think about it. Write down in the comment section below. Smash that like button. Oh yeah, Hit give subscribe. It to us. <laughs> Come on, folks. Tell, tell, tell them where they can follow us, too. You can. F- oh, well, I have to open it up here. <laughs> you can follow, uh, you can us, can follow at us at underscore Novo underscore day and days D-E and at Novo Day Media. And if you didn't like the episode, e- email Clayton. At <laughs> you Novo can send day all of your hate media mail. And tell, send all of your hate mail well, to Novo him. Day Media at Gmail. That's you got to get Novo it. Day Media to- at Gmail. But put Clayton down. <laughs> and tell him how much you don't like you know you're, you're just upset about the world just you didn't just like our commentary it. on philosophy when it, he doesn't I, like i, I, imagine, I, don't like I imagine we're gonna get someone that may be a little butthurt about the religion talk but oh um, yeah but clayton will be clayton. handling all of our He'll criticism all of the hate mail and and he will reply to each of you individually he will give you a thousand novo points <laughs> that you, you can, can also use whatever <laughs> You can also also check out our stuff at NovaDayProductions.com. There you're going to find novels like The Entropy Sessions, post of and Adulteration. Just like Buck said, the man of the hour, Bucky Ledoux. Like, subscribe, follow, hit that notification bell, rate and review. And until next time, be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media, at Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company. Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123, Aco on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J E S T U S, of the Justice And executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.